Hi, everyone. Um, why don't we kick things off? It's uh, 101. Um, nice to meet you all. My name is Matthew Jackson. I'm the Victorian uh, chapter president for ASCII. Um, and today we have a fantastic uh, discussion that will be taking place uh, with our keynote speaker, Stephen Dombrowski from QAD. Um, before we get into uh, the Stephen's uh, keynote discussion, um, we do have a few ASCII elements. Uh, there is a disruption poll um, and some also updates on current activities and things that are up and coming. Also, I just wanted to make a note that throughout Stephen's uh, presentation and discussion, uh, please feel free to raise any questions uh, within the Q&A section of, uh, of, of at the bottom here um, of your screen. You'll see a Q&A section. Please raise your questions. We have uh, a few individuals from the QAD team that will be happy to answer any of the questions um, throughout the throughout the presentation. And also we'll try to spare some time at the very end to also talk and answer some of those questions uh, or if people wanna raise them at that end specifically. Um, today is uh, the course, is, the, the session is being recorded um, and you will be able to find it at the ASCII YouTube channel. Um, on top of that, for all of us who are part of ASCII, uh, this will be allowing you to have one CPD point awarded for today's event. Um, Stephen, if you go to the next page. Thank you. Um, for all ASCII members, uh, you may have received an email uh, possibly a couple days ago in regards to a trade disruption poll. If you get the chance, please, can you uh, answer some of the questions? I've actually gone through it myself. I think it only takes about five minutes to be open and honest. Um, it is some feedback that uh, we are gathering to go back to uh, Dicer uh, in regards to some of the challenges and trade disruptions that have taken place over COVID uh, overall. Um, the poll is going to close on the, uh, the 19th of February, which is next Friday. Um, so please do take the opportunity. We will be having a, a, an opportunity as a peak industry body here. Um, thank you, Stephen. So from an ASCII update, I um, just wanted to make sure everybody is aware. That, uh, first off, congratulations to all the new registrants. Um, if there is a free self-assessment on our, our website. Um, uh, Monique, who many of you will know, is will be conducting, I believe, a media training workshop on the 19th of February. I've, in fact, signed up for it because I'm looking forward to it. Um, there are a lot of different executive roundtables uh, for different streams coming up in March. And there is the International Women's Day luncheon uh, on the 10th of March. I think um, if, if everybody can be part of those, that'd be greatly appreciated. Now, there are a few other things that we'll talk about over the next few slides. One is the, the CMAT Digital on the 16th of February. Um, there is the Global Procurement Breakfast, which is gonna be hosted out in Western Australia and Stores and Stocks Controller Certification, um, starting on the 25th and uh, the ASCII Conference. Uh, Stephen, if you can go to the next slide. Um, also, I guess I should, should say that uh, for, for all of our non-members who are not part of ASCII, um, there is no better time now to, uh, to look at ASCII as an option, and uh, there's quite a bit of uh, discounts taking place to sign up at this point. Um, and you can see a lot of the benefits from an ASCII point of view. Uh, we've got uh, a seat at the table at the CMAT um, digital uh, conference where our own Victorian vice chapter president, uh, Christine Miller um, and Monique will be presenting um, so I highly encourage each and every one of you to attend. Um, they will be talking about the warehouse now more strategic than ever elements. So some very interesting uh, discussions there. If you go to the next one. Um, we do have an upcoming event from, for, uh, being hosted out in our Western Australia team um, from a, called the Strategic Choices and Practical Issues in Global Procurement. Um, once again, for this one, you can, I believe there will be some emails going around, but also you can go to the website and sign up uh, for this. If you go to the next page. We also are, uh, have a stores and stock controller course. Um, feel free to scan the QR code. It will take you directly to the, the website and to the information that is, is needed. It is an 18 week nightly two hour online instructor led classes. Um, a lot of us uh, within ASCII will have taken a lot of these different courses and we know the value of them. 
Um, so please, please scan the code and, and learn a bit more. Also at this point, I'd like to uh, welcome all our food and grocery friends who will be, have attended today's session. Um, this is probably something that's very relevant for a lot of your organizations and companies. Stephen, the next slide. Um, we also are holding our annual conference uh, on the 28th to 30th of July. Um, I know I, I, I'm looking very much forward to going out to Sydney and meeting each and every one of you if I can, um, in a, obviously a COVID safe environment. Uh, I think we're very fortunate uh, to be able to do things of this nature. So looking forward to the end of July. Uh, also, if you are, would like to sign up for uh, the conference itself, I believe the website allows you to uh, get involved and get purchase tickets and things of that nature. Um, so Steve, if you go to the next slide. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Stephen Dombrowski. Um, Stephen has over 30 years of experience in the consumer products and food and beverage and software industries. Uh, Stephen's a director of food and beverage at QAD. He has assisted consumer products and food and beverage companies in developing SNOP strategies, as well as the implementation of ERP and supply chain systems. Stephen has held several management positions at a leading food manufacturer from supply chain manager, director of inventory controller, to manager of supply chain systems. Stephen has worked in a number of manufacturing industries, but his primary focus has been in the food and beverage and consumer products industries. He has extensive experience in supply chain and operations planning and is frequently consulted by manufacturing and consulting leaders for his opinions and advice. Without further ado, Stephen, uh, welcome. Thank you, Matthew, and I appreciate uh, you giving us the time today. On behalf of QAD, I'd like to thank uh, ASCII, yourself, Monique, and uh, all the members who are joining to uh, giving us this opportunity to have a quick chat with you today on a few things that are going on in uh, the industry. So let's talk about planning food and beverage supply chains in 2021. <clears throat> and the focus of this presentation is to talk about how food and beverage companies uh, compete as supply chains grow uh, in com complexity. Um, I don't think I need to tell everybody. It's been uh, 2020 will be a year nobody's really ever going to forget. Um, 2021 is starting off probably not much different um, in regards to some of the things that we've gone through. You know, th over the last 10 to 15 years, We've heard people talk about technology and certain things that have made the world smaller. Air travel, better air travel, better communication, the internet, the ability to actually do what we're doing right now. People from Australia, New Zealand, Asia Pacific can see me and I'm sitting here in the United States in the state of Michigan. It's made the world smaller. But I think 2020 has made the world even smaller than that. Because, you know, we all kind of operate in our own environments. We've had our own issues throughout the years. Each country, each type of demography have, has had their own issues. But in 2020, we were hit with some things that affected all of us. Um, I joked with somebody one day, somebody was complaining about they're tired of this and tired of that. You know, does anybody else feel that way? And I looked at them and say, I said, well, maybe a few maybe 7.8 billion probably feel the same way. Um, we've all, no matter what country you're in, you're in some sort of trade battle. Um, Australia, New Zealand, you're dealing with issues with China trade, other countries trade. We've dealt with it in the United States. Obviously we've dealt with the COVID crisis, which has changed just our normal day of life, never mind from a business standpoint. Um, we've dealt with global economic global environmental crisis. Uh, earlier last year, prior to COVID really going rampant across the world, I remember sitting in California at a QAD meeting and some of our colleagues from Australia were not able to join because of the wildfires that, as it turned out, did terrible damage to the wine industry. Well, fast forward nine months later and in the United States and California, we ran into the same thing. So the global wine industry has been impacted by environmental effects, never mind the effects of COVID. <clears throat> and then, of course, 
we're running into the whole sustainability issue. And is there enough food? Is there, uh, do we move to new foods, new agriculture? Do we move to protein-based, uh, plant-based proteins? This little graphic I threw up here about Aussies eat more than double the recommended amount of red meat. I'd hate to see what that statistics is for us here in the United States, especially after I just had a cheeseburger about two hours ago. So we're probably about three times um, that amount. So it's, it's been a challenge and 2020 is gonna have a severe impact on supply chains moving forward as we go through. So we have a poll right off the bat, uh, we'd like you all to answer. Are these global issues impacting your business in any way? So if you could just take a second and answer that for us. We would appreciate that as we go forward. So let's start talking about some of the additional things that have impacted not only supply chains, but culture in general that will affect food and beverage manufacturing. Um, can existing planning technologies, practices, and data allow companies to absorb and manage their supply chain during these events? Um, it's been different and there's been challenges. And 81% of you uh, have said, yes, these are impacting your business. It's kind of hard not to, um, if you think about it. In the United States and all across the world, I mean, if you were a toilet paper manufacturing company in 2019, heading into 2020, and somebody walked up to you and said, hey, this is going to be your best year ever, I think uh, people would have chuckled. At the same time, if you're a luggage manufacturer, <laughs> you probably should have prepared to do a couple different things as well. Um, it was totally unexpected. Um, and in addition to some of the things that we faced in 2020, um, there are other things that are impacting the supply chain because one thing that I think we have done as a society worldwide is we're moving on. We are dealing with this. We are still trying to manage day-to-day -day lives. People still have to live, people still have to eat. Um, even though you might not physically be going to school, kids are still going to school. People are still doing things. Um, there are alternative ways to get products, for consumers to buy products. And one of the things that the industry has done throughout this crisis is they've almost used it as a test market um, for new products. So what they're doing, and they're trying to incent people uh, to purchase products. So they're using promotions and promotional activity. Uh, and they're using social media to do it because it, it's the easiest way to get to people. The one thing we've been able to do more than ever is contact people through social media, purchase things online, communicate online. We haven't been able to do face-to-face -face meetings or gatherings, so we've done it online. So the food and manufacturing industry has taken uh, a charge to Twitter, to these type of uh, different organizations, these different media outlets, so to speak, uh, to, to challenge consumers to try new products. Another thing that has been influenced by the whole pandemic, but it was progressing even prior to COVID-19, uh, consumer buying habits has changed. Uh, we're undergoing a trans formation uh, as consumers. Now, one of the interesting thing is those of you who are watching today that are part of the food manufacturing industry that are making products for consumers, you're one yourself. Uh, I'm one. I've spent, as Matthew uh, said, uh, a long time in the food and beverage manufacturing industry. And when I worked for one of the larger food companies in the United States here, um, I also was a consumer. So I took notice um, on what other companies were doing as I was going to the grocery store with my wife. And now you can see things that are happening online. And again, this transformation is changing the way things are, are done. I remember having long commutes early in my career. And I used to get in the car, I used to have my cup of coffee, and I used to turn on the radio. And pretty much for an hour each way to work, It'd be uninterrupted time listening to either news or music or a sports station or whatever. 
now with technology, they say technology has been able to make your lives easier. You're going to have more free time. Um, I personally think that couldn't be further from the truth because now you are accessible 24 hours a day. You have the ability to work 24 hours a day. Um, we joke with some colleagues that COVID with everybody working from home, you're actually not working from home, you're actually sleeping in the office. And through these type of tools now, it's been able to influence consumers buying behavior and thus it's changing the value chain, not just the supply chain, but it's changing the value chain, meaning the different points where consumers can access and get the goods and services that people like yourselves sell. For example, online ordering. How many of you have gone to a grocery store recently? I think it's been about a month for myself. One of the things that is also changing is if you look on the right side of the screen, you see the old fashioned milk box that's pretty much an international symbol. Um, companies in technology are now starting to look at ways to have sensors, sense products, and have foods delivered to milk boxes that are now electronically updated and operated in people's homes. So there's gonna be a continued transformation on what's happening of the home delivery service and how those foods and how those products are ordered. Another, another area that we've seen significant changes obviously is in the food service and the restaurant transformation, because let's face it, many restaurants worldwide, company cafes, company cafeterias, school cafeterias, uh, cafeterias in businesses were shut down for a period of time because of COVID. Where I am in the United States, we are still, restaurants are only operating at 25% capacity here in the state of Michigan. Some states are open, some states are still closed. So it's very interesting that, and if you are a manufacturer that are in the food service business, this has affected your ability to produce products and deliver products. Um, I have a bit of a case study coming up in a bit that will illustrate some of these purposes. Another thing that we need to talk about is as you're running through your normal business, if and some people had to shut down, um, what if a machine broke down and you had to get parts from an area or a country or a state or a region that wasn't operating? There have been manufacturing facilities that weren't able to uh, open because machines broke and they weren't able to get the replacement parts because they weren't able to get the transformation from a certain location. So this has impacted a number, a number of areas. Uh, changing consumer behavior is another area that we've, we've already started talking about, which has impacted the industry. Um, I happen to know our local director of Walmart. And when the toilet paper rush happened, he said they weren't even putting it on the shelves. They were just dropping it in the center store aisle. In fact, to this day, they still don't restock the shelves of toilet paper, paper towels, hand sanitizer, and certain shelf stable foods such as soups and canned meals because people are buying them so fast. I'm not sure if people are hoarding or stocking up on it, but the sales have still gone through the roof on some of these products. Uh, so store employees aren't even bothering putting them on the shelves anymore. It's impacted transportation, it's impacted manufacturing, and it's impacted supply chains globally uh, due to this mad rush of products. It's really impacting uh, the entire business and entire manufacturing operations. So food and beverage supply chains, how are they different? <clears throat> well, Tim Harford, has this quote, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. What matters is how the quickly the leader is able to adapt. I think what we have seen over the last 20 years is change is, is, is ongoing and change is the new normal. Uh, it used to be if a customer changed an order, if a line went down for an hour, that was called a disruption. It isn't today. So we are now seeing changes and disruptions on a day-to-day -day basis. So in the last year, if not more, 
we have a new another poll coming up for you, which is, have you seen changes to your value and supply chains? Uh, we'd like to know if, and it's not just based on COVID, it could be consumer behavior, but have you noticed changes to the value and supply chains in recent years? So to continue on again with this quote, we accept that um, supply planning and tactical strategic planning uh, is an important part to achieve our corporate objectives. Uh, but how many people should be included in this? So you all have graciously responded and 95% of you have said, yes, you've seen changes to your value chain and supply chain. So what this means is, okay, what type of changes? That's the first question we need to ask. Um, and there could be many areas that they've been impacted. Now, if you have experience and changes, how are you gonna handle them? How are you handling, handling them? How should you handle them? Should it be a planning function? Who sh should be involved? Should it be the senior executives? Should it be the middle directors, middle management? Or should it be in the entire company? So those are some of the questions that we need to answer moving forward is how do we do this? How do we respond? to disruption. If you talk to industry experts, a lot of industry experts will sit there and say, you need to do it with agility. First of all, you need to have visibility. You need to be able to see across your enterprise. You need to be able to, to get information quickly and see the exceptions to the normal day-to-day -day operation. Now, now who, however, that's the next question. I personally think Anybody in the organization that has anything to do with the production, the movement, the supply of the goods that are going to affect a company's profits or bottom line should have visibility to that operation and the, that information. Because if you don't, you're not going to be properly prepared to act the way you should, especially when these disruptions occur. That leads me to collaboration. So how do you collaborate? Well, those silos need to be broken down. You need to have data and you're gonna notice through some of these slides. And as I talk about how to handle these disruptions, a lot of it's gonna be around information. There's an old quote, knowledge is power. The more information, the more knowledge that you have, the better you have to react to problems and issues. So you want to get this data and you want to have scenarios, you want to have some risk management in place and you want to collaborate that through the organization. So as you are making these choices, especially dealing with collaborations, you're doing it with intelligence. And this is across the entire board. So it's across from a disruption standpoint. And it's also as you're looking at the day-to-day -day business of launching new products, managing the day-to-day -day business. You wanna look at how those events are forecasted throughout the operation from top to bottom. Very critical in, in moving forward. And then of course, we wanna do this in real time. Um, the old phrase that I've heard growing up, the early bird gets the worm. As something occurs, you wanna make sure that you respond quickly, you respond intelligently uh, because any delay is going to impact the entire process, the entire supply chain. And the bottom line is if you have a customer who might be a retailer, they need to satisfy their customer, the consumers. And the slightest little bit of delay is going to mean something won't be on the shelf. Something won't be on the shelf online when somebody wants to order it. And guess what? They're going to order somebody else's. So you need this information, this visibility, this collaboration, and this intelligent wrapped up in a nutshell in a real time to be able to move forward and succeed. <clears throat> so what happens if you can adapt to these changes? This slide we used this slide in a presentation at QAD about a year ago. Uh, we did an event called QAD Tomorrow uh, when we were talking about where things are headed in the industry and how companies like us can help companies like you. And the first thing we have to ask is, are you going to be around? One of the big topics of today 
is sustainability. Now, when you talk about sustainability, people automatically start thinking about things like turning the lights on and off, recycling, packaging, those type of things, litter. You know, you drive down the street and you see some soda pop cans or candy wrappers on the ground. And you're like, that's not sustainability. Well, that's litter and you can't really classify all that. Sustainability is the ability, is having the ability to adapt to changes so that you can continue to progress and continue to exist. So if you look at some of the technologies, for example, of the past that we don't use anymore, those companies have gone away. Remember when everybody wanted a BlackBerry and if you didn't have a BlackBerry, at least where I'm from, you weren't considered cool if you didn't have a BlackBerry. Well, where are those Blackberries now? I think I still have one. I think it's in that behind that door here in this room in a box at the bottom of the closet. So they weren't able to adapt. So will you adapt? And even though one of the mantras of a food business is everybody has to eat, are you willing to make the changes? Are you willing to put in place the practices and the processes and the systems to adapt to the changes so you will be here in 10 years? With that, we have another poll. So do you have the processes in place to quickly adapt to supply chain disruptions? So please answer this for us. <clears throat> the answers are, we are prepared. We struggle with disruptions. And then of course, uh, not applicable to your situation. But we'd really be interested in what you have to say in this regard, because again, disruptions are the way of the future, my friends. And if you don't have the systems and processes in place, uh, it's gonna be tough to move forward. So let's start talking and we'll get the results of that poll momentarily. Let's start talking about how to do this. And here are those answers. So, okay, perfect. We're about split, about 50-50, which, um, which is really interesting. And it's also um, some good information. So 47% of you said we are prepared to adapt to changes and that's great but 49% say that we struggle with disruptions. So we need to start digging into, you know, why is that? And if you do struggle, how do we, how do we move forward? Now, one of the things that I ask our customers um, that I talk to quite often, especially throughout the pandemic, is one of the things you wanna do is you wanna take a look at what processes and what systems worked and stayed viable during the pandemic, but most importantly, what didn't? What systems, what processes failed you during this and what needed to be changed? So during disruptions, one of the things our customers have said to me is flexibility is critical. So you need to synchronize, not just the horizontal planning process, but the vertical planning process. And that starts from top to bottom and it goes back up. It's a lot of people have different names for it. Financial SNOP, sales and operation plannings. I think people sometimes try to put too many catchy and, and you know, trendy names on basic processes that should be in place. And it's, you need to be able to not just blend the strategic operations and strategic decisions. You need to blend them with the tactical decisions to stay the course. So it's, part of the management structure and the planning process that you take those operational goals, you sync them with the strategic goals, and then you have to make sure that they are linked to the day-to-day -day operations. To do this, everybody in the organization has to be in line and communication is the key to making this happen. Without communication, without those processes of communications, and then the systems to give you the data and to process that data and enact the next steps to executing the plan, you're not gonna be very flexible or functional in, in moving forward. So those are some of the kind of the ways of synchronizing that vertical planning process to get you moving forward. <clears throat> I wanted to spend a couple minutes talking about an interesting story of a customer of ours um, who had some issues during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, it's a frozen food uh, manufacturer. Um, and they ran into uh, some interesting turmoil and their business model was, was altered. 
uh, and they were able to do it by having certain systems and certain processes in place. This company, their manufacturing, their operations, about 53% of their demand is food service. Um, schools, restaurants, uh, food service, sales centers, um, corporate cafeterias, and the fast food restaurants, one of which was McDonald's. Thank goodness for McDonald's keeping one of their items on their menu because they were able to continue some of this business. But for the most part, other than that, other than the McDonald's piece, they lost most, for a good part of last year, most of their retail, their food service business, rather, because of that. So about 50% of their food service business just about disappeared. Now, one of the interesting things about this customer is their manufacturing lines were set up that they had food service lines and retail production lines set up to operate. Now, while the food service business kind of tanked, other than their McDonald's business, their retail demand skyrocketed. It went crazy and it went crazy through the club stores in the United States, through Costco, through Sam's, through Walmart, some of the bigger stores, <clears throat> people were, were going crazy. The online sales of the product also went out, 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 off the roof. The interesting thing about it though, it was to SKUs, SKUs, it was to products that they didn't normally sell. So their top sellers were no longer selling. These products that weren't popular have now become very popular. So they had to change. They had to change suppliers. They had to change supplies. And they had to start making different SKUs that people were now buying. And the normal high selling items were not being sold. This changed the way they had to utilize their manufacturing equipment. Now, the other issue that impacted it, so what made this the perfect storm, so to speak, is they have an older workforce in their manufacturing operations, many of whom chose not to participate, to stay home. They were given the option in the United States, if you felt like it'd be a threat, and this was a very close proximity type of manufacturing, elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder production lines, you could stay home without fear of your job. So they didn't have enough workers in the facility. So food service demand goes down. Retail demand goes crazy. Retail demand goes crazy for products they don't normally sell, but they didn't have the assets and they didn't have the people to make the products. So what did they have to do? Well, a demand planning tool was used to perform what if analysis on their changing demand patterns, because first and foremost, that's what happened. Their value chain changed because people were also ordering online. So the point of sale have, has changed, which meant the distribution network has changed. So the manufacturer had to change their distribution model. Um, they had to get an SNOP process used to alter their supply chain network because that network changed. They were shipping more direct to store warehouses than the normal warehouse chain. So a four to five step network model was now shrunk to sometimes three and even two. They did an analysis of alternate production sources the potential use of co-packers was also engaged. And then production planning was implemented to optimize capacity and resources. So that's what they were did. They turned it around very quickly. They had a tool in place. They had some help putting these processes in place and they were able to alternate their supply network and they were able to analyze alternatives to handle these surges in demand and these changes. So the demand planning tool was used to perform what if scenarios. Uh, SNOP processes were used to alter the network. Uh, production planning was able to manage the amount of people and assets they did have working to maximize production and improve efficiencies, uh, maximize the use of the machinery with also minimizing disruptions. And they were able to start delivering their products on time uh, much faster than at the initial onset of the pandemic. So it was a pretty interesting story. And um, <clears throat> unfortunately, we don't have a poll question around this, but I'd be very curious um, if some of you have run into some of these type of situations through your business model through the whole uh, COVID-19 issue. So let's start kind of wrapping some of these things up here. So 
the pace of change has never been faster than what it is today. Um, and it's never going to be as slow as it is either. I think one of the things that uh, environmental issues such as fires, consumers changing their preferences, COVID-19, pandemics hit, hitting globally, impacting global business, impacting everybody on the planet. We're not just sitting here saying, oh, those people over there, these people over here, it's affected everybody. Um, is that we need to be prepared for the worst, both personally and professionally. When we're planning our business strategies, when we're looking at the manufacturing process, the distribution products of essential items, no matter what you make, um, there are such things called luxury food items. So if you're in the luxury food business, such as certain confections, certain high-end foods, how are you gonna move forward and how has this pandemic affected that market for you to you know, be around like that one slide showed in 10 years. If you make day-to-day -day foods, necessary foods and consumer products like toilet paper, like canned soups, canned meals, the essentials, do you have the systems and processes in place that you can adapt when all of a sudden your demand peaks at 500% like it did for certain products? These things all have to be in place uh, and you need to be able to react on a moment's notice to be able to handle those issues. So what are some of the steps to do this? One of the things that uh, we like to call it is we like to talk, uh, talk about the agile supply chain. So some of the things you, you need to deal with is, you know, don't bite off more than you can chew. Don't try to save the world in one shot. Um, because if you try to do too much, you're gonna get overwhelmed. So you need to be able to uh, go one step at a time. So one of the things that I suggest is, is what I mentioned a, a few moments ago. Take a good look at your systems and processes, if you can. I know some of your businesses are still crazy at the moment. But if you can, take an analysis of your systems and processes, what you have going on now, and see, analyze what worked. So what helped us through this pandemic, through these crises. If you're a wine manufacturer, what helped us manage throughout these fires that may have totally wiped out our operations? What worked and what didn't? And start trying to fix those pieces and maybe put new pieces in place. Maybe you need a completely different process. Maybe you need a completely different system, or maybe you just need a tweak. Again, don't try to save the world. The, the, the answer may be simpler than what you think. Now, in some cases, you may need to alter your processes and you may need new systems and that's quite possible. But you, you need to be smart and get the information to make those decisions. Now, the digital supply chain, that's critical. Um, advanced technologies. <clears throat> Matthew, in the introduction, stated I spends a lot of time in the food industry in a food manufacturing facility, many food manufacturing facilities and food businesses. And one of the things I will tell you that I know that the food manufacturing industry is a little slow embracing technology and that's okay. We were where I used to work. We were very slow. I like to point out that there's two type of technologies in food and beverage manufacturing. That's direct technology and indirect technology. Direct technology is the technology that impacts your day-to-day -day ability to produce your products. So your packing line, your mixing tanks, your ovens, your baking lines, your processing tanks, your processing lines, that's direct technology. And those are the things where food and beverage companies consistently use the highest end because you want to get that maximum throughput. You want to replace all machines. So that's direct technology. It's very expensive. Fixing them are expensive, but those, those are the bread and butter that can you get product out the door. We've been a little slow at what I call the indirect technology, which is the planning systems, ERP systems, uh, warehousing systems, transportation systems, suppliers, uh, SNOP, sales and operation plannings, some of the technology that monitors crops who are can tie suppliers to your organizations, to your different pieces. That indirect technology is some of the area using the internet of things, manufacturing 4.0, 
industry 4.0. Those are some of the things that we need to start embracing in the food and beverage business because it will help us make those decisions quickly. It'll help build out end-to-end -end visibility, which is critical. Those are some of the things that we really need to look at. You want to focus on reducing the time to replan because you're going to have to replan. Like I said, a line going down, a customer changing an order, a raw material, an ingredient, a packaging supply not coming in on time. That's not a disruption, folks. That's life in the day-to-day -day food and beverage business. So those are the things that we, we need to focus on and we need to be able to have at our fingertips plan A, plan B, plan C, and forward. You need to be able to reduce that time. You want the entire organization and everybody involved in the process to be part of your ecosystem, which means collaboration, which means communication. And when I say that, notice how I said ecosystem and not your company, because that ecosystem is outside of your company as well. It's not just your organization, it's your suppliers. It's the delivery, the transportation partners, the warehousing partners, the 3PL people that you might use. It could be your customers. You need to collaborate with your customers. It also could be co-packers. Co-packers and contract manufacturers are starting to be even bigger than they ever were in food and beverage manufacturing simply because it gives us the ability to give an extended arm of our manufacturing, especially if we need to produce in areas we typically didn't produce to handle that online purchasing buying surge, to handle delivery next day. You're not going to have next day delivery all the time if you're only your sole manufacturing facility is in Perth and you want to deliver to Sydney. What do we do? Do we spend $10 million and build a new facility in Sydney? How about finding a co-packer? That opens up that market. So when I talk about the ecosystem, it's, it's not just your company, it's the entire pieces of the puzzle that can link together that can be part of your organization, even though it's not internal, it's external too. And leave automation to last. Now you're going to sit there and say, okay, you just contradicted yourself, Steve. You, you talked about all these things, but leave automation to last. What I'm saying about automation is start with processes, start with the important systems, start with the important technologies that's going to protect your investments, going to protect your bottom line. And then from the, the high end possibilities, then you, you can automate. But you can't just start adding technology if you don't have a plan and if you don't have those processes in place. Those are the most critical things you need to do. So with that, um, I'd like to start talking and uh, opening up uh, for some questions. But beforehand, that's right, we do have a poll. And uh, do you see a need for improving your processes and systems relevant to supply chain management and optimization? So if you can answer this, uh, the responses are pretty simple. Our processes are up to date. We cannot handle disruptions and our processes and systems are disconnected. So if you could uh, answer those, I would appreciate it. And then we can uh, take a look in a moment on some of those responses. And if any of you have any questions, we can uh, go through those as well. All right, here we go with some answers. What's interesting is about 20% of the attendees are saying that this really isn't, that question wasn't really applicable. Um, but for those that were the other 80%, 35% uh, are saying that our processes and systems are completely disconnected. 26% uh, are saying that you can't handle disruptions. So if I, my math is correct, if my third grade teachers were good, that would be about 61% of you are saying that right now we, we have some issues with processes and systems not handling disruptions. 20%, 21% process are up to date. 
first and foremost, let's let's talk about this for a second before we jump into Q&A. First of all, to that 21%, that's excellent because it means that you have been planning, you've been anticipating that, hey, things are going to change. So we need to get our processes and systems in place. And that means that you have risk management. It means you have some self-analysis in. So that is excellent news. Now for the other 61% of you, that doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. It just simply means that throughout the course of business, things, everybody's like that. I don't think anybody could have been prepared for what has happened in 2020. And we're probably not prepared what's gonna happen in 2021. <clears throat> so again, if, if I were to go back to that previous slide prior to jumping into our questions and answers, let's talk about the steps. Analyze which processes, which systems failed you. Make a list of those, get those down, and then start figuring out and make a list of what did, did work and then start figuring out, okay, what's the easiest way to start handling it? Again, you, you, wanna, you wanna bite this off simply and easily because you can sit there and say, you know what, every one of our systems, we're just gonna shut the lights off and start completely over. Well, in some cases that may be the right thing to do, in some cases it won't. So again, you wanna embrace, start embracing the digital supply chain. You wanna start focusing on the things that you can improve now. And you can do things in multiple steps and you can do things simultaneously as well. So you can do some of the quicker things and then you can do some of the longer term plans, longer term process changes at the same time. Okay, so I think Matthew, I'm going to um, call you back in and see if we have any questions that some of our attendees would potentially like to ask. Uh, Stephen, that was fantastic. I think there's, um, I think there's a question um, by VJ. Um, how does the executive roundtable? Oh, that's for me. Okay, haha. -ha. Uh, it's uh, VJ. I'll tell you offline. It's in regards to executive roundtable work, and who are authorized to attend this event. I can I can bring you up to speed. Um, and Flavio uh, with co-packers. So Stephen, this one for yourself. Uh, Flavio uh, asks. With co-packers getting bigger and bigger, so is their uh, bargaining power a hard truth? Um, are there alternatives? That, that is actually a great question um, because, um, you know, think about it. And um, your, your question goes hand in hand is actually how I poised it. You know, the world today is changing. Consumer preferences are, are changing. Um, so... Uh, online shopping, people want things the next day. I know here in the US, when we first started with Amazon Prime, I think it was two to three days. I'm like, wow, I can't believe I can get this two to three days. Now I have to wait two days for something and I'm absolutely freaking out because I'm like, why can't I get it tomorrow? Why can't I get it today? They actually started some online, you know, you can get it today type of deliveries. But if your facilities to handle this aren't in that location, um, it's actually going to cost you more as a manufacturer to provide that service than the profit you're going to make. So that's kind of how I brought in the whole thing about co-packers. But you're right. The co-packer utilization now is getting bigger than ever before. Um, we're getting more dependent on co-packers. So again, it's, what is it? It's pure economics. It's supply and demand. Like you, Flavio, you mentioned. It's um, their bargaining power is, is bigger. So I think... In terms of alternatives, some may have you a bit over a barrel, but I think what it, it does is it goes back again to that last slide. And when you're making plans and figuring out what products you're going to have co-packed, what products you're going to have in-house, it you need to have that SNOP process or not even SNOP. I keep saying, putting a name on it. You need to have the processes in place that when you do have to use the co-packers, they're not in a position where they're threatening and holding you over the barrel. So you, you, the better prepared you are and to be able to negotiate with the co-packers and get alternatives, the better you're gonna be. So ho hopefully that answers that question. Now we have a couple more questions about the supply chain digitalization. So we have, uh, 
Uh, and thank you, Flavio, for joining today. I really appreciate your time. Uh, hopefully you got some, uh, hopefully I made some sense throughout the presentation for you. Uh, Mauricio, can you please clarify a bit more about what digitalization of the supply chain is? No problem. So th throughout my career, I've had the ability to work in industry and outside of industry. Um, if you look at a typical person's resume, we, we always put our resumes vertical. You know, the, the current job, and then the, the last and the second last. If you were to look at mine on a horizontal basis, you would notice that half my time has spent, been spent in industry and half the time has been spent working for a company like QAD or a consulting company, um, providing solutions to people in those industries. So what the digitalization was, when I first started, um, in the industry, I was a production planner and I'm going to show you what my production planning tools were back in the day. So it was this actually, no, that's wrong. This is a pen. I actually had a pencil because I made mistakes. So I had an eraser and a piece of paper and I had a ruler, which I don't have handy. And I manually drew a spreadsheet. I created my own spreadsheet and that's what I planned on. We eventually evolved when personal computing came in the middle of the 80s, we came into Lotus Notes and then Excel. The digitalization of the supply chain is all that wrapped in one. It's being able to automate certain steps, certain processes, and through technology, tie those pieces together. So it's automating the process of planning distribution planning and tying it back to production planning taking that production plan and linking it to your suppliers. But most importantly, once the suppliers come back, you can quickly swing it back to your distribution plan so everything is in sync. So the digitalization of the supply chain simply means you're connecting it better through technology and with faster and more reliable data. So that rolls into Muhammad's question. Um, he's wondering, what would be involved in digital supply chain transformation? Is it about digitalized planning or much more? Well, that's a very good question. And it's, it's both. So yes, it starts off with, with planning because linking and breaking down those silos. So tying your distribution plan, like I just said, the distribution planning to the production planning and then to the supplier. But it's also most importantly is communication. So having open lines of communications to your customers when they change orders or if they, you know, working in a, in a tighter relationship with them, number one. Uh, also communication with your suppliers and communication internally. So again, it's not just about the planning process. It's about the entire communication process about introducing new products and, and those type of things. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, and I love this. We're, we're starting to get more questions. This is this is absolutely awesome. So let's talk uh, Klaus. Klaus, thank you for joining. I appreciate it. So you talked about supply chain agility. It is often said that agility may clash with the lean supply chain concept as the former may incur additional costs while the former aims to reduce costs. Appreciate your comments on agile versus lean. In other words, are they compatible? Interesting point. And I'll, I'll, I'll answer this question kind of with a story and, I, and hopefully it'll, it'll um, resonate and, and give you an answer. So I was talking to a colleague one point and this colleague was talking about selling demand and supply chain systems. And she was mentioning to me that I'm gonna to talk to this big food company um, because I think it'd be great. And, and I said, oh, that's interesting. I used to work with the person that now runs that supply chain business. I, I used to work with that person. And they said, Oh, can you give me my phone number, their phone number, because I want to call him up. And I want to tell him that we're going to improve his customer service by 100% with our new tool. And we're going to do this. And his we're going to do that. And his service level is going to be 100%. And he's never going to short another customer and yada, yada, yada. And, and I said, you know what, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you his number. And I want you to conference me in because I want to hear this conversation, but do me a favor. Do not tell him I gave you his number because I'm still good friends with him because I don't want to stop talking to him. 
you never ever <laughs> want to tell a food manufacturer or a consumer product manufacturer that you're going to get their service levels to 100%. Because I can go back six slides and show you that empty boardroom because that food company will probably be out of business. Because the inventory costs that are going to entail to, to service everybody at 100% is, is going to drive probably drive you out of business. So this is where we talk about that agility versus lean. I might be agile and I might be able to quickly satisfy a customer's requirements because I have all the inventory in the world, but <laughs> Klaus, good catch. It's not very lean. So there's a balance. So you need to look when you're managing your service levels, who can you balance? Who can you offset? What customers will work with you and maybe take a late order on some things and other things else? How do you balance your suppliers and tie in your suppliers? So you're not running all this extra inventory, but you're still saying lean. So yes, they are compatible. And I'm actually going to jump back to the previous questions comment about better planning. I think better planning is one of the areas where this will help balance out agile versus lean. So Klaus, again, thanks for joining. Hopefully that answered your question. Let's talk VJ. Question on the freight cost increase through China, primarily part of the supply chain. Uh, does the U.S foresee a reduction in the container availability? Does the U.S. foresee risk mitigation in this space? If there is less relevant topic, I understand, just want to understand your thoughts. Um, transportation and freight costs through have been increasing throughout the last several years, uh, especially when you're talking about these some of these trade wars and these trade issues we've been going through. Now, what COVID do, has done is because supply chains have been stretched uh, supply networks have been broken and have had to be adjusted. Um, we, we have seen that it has increased. Um, it's also reduced certain transportation methods. Uh, we are running into a container availability because what's happening is as we break some of these normal supply chain patterns. What's happening is we're getting less than full trailers, less than full containers. And so we're actually, and we're running out of trucks. And I know it's a global problem where we're just running out of transportation vessels because of so many shipments that are happening. So there may be some need for risk mitigation. What that is right now, I'm not hundred percent sure. Um, but this by no means is, is not relevant. Um, that, that is critical uh, right now to keeping supply chains intact. Okay, um, let's see, any others? VJ, thank you again for joining. Perfect, well, I, I appreciate everybody's responses to the poll questions. That was uh, very helpful to me to direct some of my comments as I was going through this presentation. And I also want to thank you for your questions because um, if you have questions, that means that, you know, some of this information that we tried to give you today uh, did make some sense to you and have some impact into your day-to-day -day business. And uh, again, I can't thank uh, ASCII enough for uh, having QAD uh, participate. I'd be more than welcome to do more of these uh, to help our friends, uh, you know, I, I'm an American, so I got to say it, help our friends down under. Uh, you knew it was coming. So I waited till the last possible second to get that in. But I appreciate all your time today. Hey, thank you very much for that, Stephen. Uh, what a fantastic uh, discussion and documentation and everything that you took us through. It was very, very insightful and helpful. Um, I just wanted to, to say to everybody, feel free to reach out to Stephen. I think he's got his email address up there. SD7. Oh, sure. Please do at qad.com um, for if you have any follow-up questions that you'd like to, to have. Um, please uh, feel free to reach out. Um, and thank you very much, Stephen, for uh, your fantastic presentation. And oh, thank you QAD. very much. Thanks, Matthew. Great job setting this up. We really appreciate uh, the hard work from Monique and yourself to uh, get us to do this. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And once again, I'll just say uh, from an ASCII point of view, uh, thank you. And uh, if you are interested in any further information, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good day.